Welcome back, everybody. Bear Bets Podcast College Football Week 1 is back. And here I'm back. We're, we're here. Week 1 is here. But we're all, we are all back again. Sammy P and Will will join us uh, during the gambling group chat. My co-host, as always, Jeff Schwartz. And Jeff, uh, we, we have made it. We have made it through the summer. All the, uh, the, the Steve Spurrier talking season is over. We had some games last week where we had a, an outright double-digit underdog win. Uh, Georgia Tech, you had uh, SMU was a massive favorite who probably should have lost. Yep. You had uh, an FCS favorite, Montana State, who is a double-digit favorite that probably should have lost. You had Hawaii sleepwalk through a game against uh, Delaware State. So <laughs> the uh, as, as Brent Musburger would say, the underdogs were howling. Uh, last week so are there lessons to be learned from that uh, and uh, apply them to this week or is it just kind of like circumstantial uh, I think there's a couple lessons to be learned right there, there's not there's never an always right or never right in college football in the NFL but you know there's a lesson to be learned in the Florida State Georgia Tech game you have one team that came off a 13-0 season bear that replaced a ton of production, right? Quarterback, running backs, wide receivers, offensive linemen, pass rushers. And they did that via high school recruiting, but also a lot of portal players, right? They had to come together all at once, go on the road and play a game against a Georgia Tech offense bear that returned a ton of production. A lot of offensive linemen, quarterback skill guys, and the team that just looked a little more cohesive. The, you know, the Georgia Tech offense took control of that game. Florida State had one drive in the final 21 minutes of this game. One offensive drive, that was it. And so can we apply that forward, right? Can we look at matchups this weekend and say, look, where are the returning production at? Now, again, there is a returning production that is good. There are teams that return production that stink. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that, you know, that they're going to be good all of a sudden. But we can sort of apply that to a lot of games this weekend. Is Michigan going to be as good in week one with a – bunch of brand new players as they might be in week eight, nine, 10, or 11. Like you have to look at these teams and look at the production coming out. Washington, I sent a text to a Washington buddy and showed the, 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 Whoa, the, you, the, have, you the, actually have a friend, yes. a friend who is, yes. a, wow. and um, I, I said, do you know anyone on this too deep? Do you know a single person? And he said he knows 14. I was pretty surprised out of 44, but the point is like the, some of these teams are brand new. I'm not saying that Weber state, but you have to take into consideration, I think, in week one, Bear. New transfer portal players everywhere. You have to be cohesive together. What, who's starting? Who's not starting? Are you on the road? Are you playing someone who has a bunch of returning starters? That was my takeaway uh, out of the one big game. Because, look, New Mexico, Montana State was a fun watch at the end, especially. Hawaii, Delaware State, I tried to watch it on film, Bear. I couldn't make it about 20 plays. It was a little rough. Um, so, like, you know, there, there's the one main takeaway from that big Now, that being said, you, you said it was rough. How do you apply that to Hawaii UCLA moving ahead this week? Well, we'll talk about that later. Okay. okay. A little radio tease, a little radio tease there. Um, I, I think you just throw that game out in that specific instance. They're up 14 nothing early. Del- it was it, not to disparage Delaware State. But it, it, they looked a little smaller on film than Hawaii did. Like I, I, I can understand Hawaii getting up early and saying, like, we're sort of shutting it down offensively and just sort of keeping everything in front of us on defense. Like it was, it was what it was. But um, Bear, full slate of games this weekend. Thursday night we get the narrative game: Colorado, North Dakota State. Into Friday, into Saturday, into Sunday. Uh, that huge game. I think the, the the number one game for the weekend for how we drive narratives for the rest of the season is not Florida Miami because I think Miami is going to be good. It's LSU USC. It's almost a, a loser leave town game. Whoever loses this game, Bear probably has no shot at the playoff. If you win, you feel good that you have a shot at the playoff. If you lose, you're probably out, right? I mean, you're, you're that's one loss you can't afford. And, with their conference schedules, yeah, you're you're looking at having to go nine and two at least the rest of the year. At, at, at least, uh, if you happen to fall, I mean, I think there is a chance for a nine and three team uh, from the Big Ten or the SEC that can make the playoff if you pick up the right combination of wins along the way. But yeah, I, I think that is going to be a, a a kind of a a barometer type game for uh, we we always ask who is the which conference is best, and I think if you have a uh, a game between two ranked uh, teams from the SEC and the Big Ten. People are going to jump to conclusions one way or another uh, as a result of, of that game. See, I do think that the Miami Florida game is is kind of fascinating too because I think it's either it's going to be confirmation bias one way or the other. Like 
If oh, Miami yeah. wins, it's going to be. See, I told you Miami was going to be good, and Florida and Florida was going to going to stink. But if it, if it goes the other way, then it's going to be uh, here we go again, Miami. And oh, maybe we were. See, I told, I told you Florida had a better roster. Just their win total was low because of their schedule. So, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's good that we got these couple of those games spread out uh, over the course of a couple of days. Uh, before we get into the gambling group chat, uh, play right off the top here that I do like. I, I like Miami of Ohio getting the three against Northwestern. I mean, Northwestern last year was an unbelievable story, winning a bowl game. They were a dog in 10 games last year, one half of them outright. Uh, they probably aren't the most talented roster, but they played so well together um, last season. Uh, but I'm not sure they're that much more talented than than uh, Brett Gabbert and coming back from injury again and a Miami of Ohio team that won the MAC last year. I took Miami of Ohio uh, plus three. Very curious to see uh, the makeshift Northwestern home stadium for the year uh, right right on the lake as Ryan Field gets uh, gets renovated. So it's a pl- so play one, and I'll have some more uh, in in the gambling group chat for sure. Um, Miami of Ohio plus three against Northwestern. Any 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 other? plays that we uh, may not cover here in the uh, gambling group chat uh, outside of the best bet that you got for us. This is how you guys know, if you're new to the podcast, that we actually make these wagers because no one would come on here and give you Miami of Ohio plus three if they weren't actually doing this in real life. Bears going to have a couple later that you're going to be stunned by. I always love the best bets. Like It's not Miami of Florida, right? It's never those games. So I, I, I put all my gambling group chat. I have a couple more later, Bear. Uh, nothing on the top of my head right now. I've tried. Look, I, I think... Week one is a very tough week to wager on college football. You just don't know a lot about these teams. And, um, you know, my menu for wagers is small right now. It may increase as I watch more football. So as we talked about in previous episodes, I'm home alone all weekend. It's me and the dog and my grill and whatever food I'm going to make. I'm I'm getting my menu together, Bear, for the the entire weekend. Um, And so I might live wager uh, if I see fit. But I'm trying to try my best, Bear, to keep my menu small because we we just not food menu my gambling menu because we don't know yeah. a lot about these teams like we just it again the portal and the freshmen and, and new coaches and new coordinators everywhere there's a lot of plays I think I like um but I need to see them play a couple of weeks before I feel comfortable wagering on some of these teams couple questions here for you dog gonna sleep in bed with you no no that, that, that would be struggling discouraged. We don't want to start a trial. I, I don't. I don't roll. I we the dog never sleeps in the bed. She, my wife was out of town last weekend, two weekends ago with with Alex. Uh, no, no sleeping in the bed. He jumps in the bed like at six thirty to wake me up, but okay. he does not sleep in the bed. No. Okay. Dog gonna hop up on the couch with you and watch yes. the game. He's gonna be okay. Beautiful. Yeah. He. Dog. I just don't tell my wife. Uh, he's in the on the couch, but no, he he will just sleep in my lap. It's awesome. He is a good boy. Uh, he pe- pe- people food. No. Wow, you are a tight ship there. I like he, it. Look, a couple of reasons. He he's a German Shepherd, so his stomach can get a little a, a little iffy. Uh, mm-hmm. He doesn't eat though, Bear. He's not like me and you. In in a seven day stretch, he will eat about four and a half dinners. Like he he will go and skip a dinner. Like he will do like it's, so. He's not driven by food. Um, so no, not not no human food for him. Pool? He, he, does he like to swim? Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, he'll go in the pool. Oh yeah. He will. Go, he will. It's supposed to be hot this weekend. He will definitely be in the pool with me. Uh, one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to spray my entire yard with like the the fog, the the mosquito fog. So I have no mosquitoes all weekend. Hopefully, get to hang out in the backyard, watch a lot of football. I'm I'm debating already in my head the TV setup and where what TVs I'm going to watch games on, especially Saturday night because Oregon's playing at 7:30. So is UCLA Hawaii. We'll talk about the game in a second. So is A and M and 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 Texas, uh, Texas Tech. So. A lot of games, you know, again, the slate is great there, right? We have Georgia Clemson early, right? We have the Florida Miami game next, the AM Notre Dame game, then you have your games that we're wagering on sprinkled in throughout there. My favorite team's at 7 30, yours at 3 30. The big new kickoff game as well, Penn State, West Virginia there in that early slot. Like it's a good weekend of ball. Thursday night games, Friday night games, Sunday night, we get LSU and USC. I, I cannot wait, buddy. It's going to be a fantastic weekend of football. And to break it down even more, here's Sammy and Will to join Jeff and I in the Gambling Group Chat. College football is back. The Gambling Group Chat is back. Myself, Sammy, Will, and Jeff. So it's it's, it's an interesting opening uh, full week of college football here. Only, you only have the three 
uh, mat, uh, ranked matchups, A&M, Notre Dame, the Sunday night game between LSU and USC, and then Georgia, Clemson. So uh, not a ton of heavyweight matchups, but but certainly a, a bunch, a much better schedule than we had last week, and, and certainly a lot of stories and a lot of teams and a lot of games uh, to, to dive into. We may as well just start with the, uh, the number one ranked team in the country, Georgia, laying now at 13, 13 and a half against Clemson. Are, are we maybe sleeping a little bit on Clemson? Maybe it's a little bit of a a retro uh, look back to last week with what we don't have from Florida State. Like, are we going to be in a position here at the end of the year where where Dabo is going to be preaching, oh, you tried to write off little old Clemson, oh, Cle- Clemson might wind up winning the ACC. Like, like what, what do we expect from Clemson in this game, Sammy, if at anything at all? Or what do you expect from Georgia in this game? Dabo would love to be able to do that at the end of the season, for the record. He would love that. <laughs> I find it fascinating this line hasn't quite gotten to 14. It's getting close. But every time you think it's going to go to 14, it comes back the other way. There are some 13s in the market right now. It's a very sharp shops. So the fact that it's just under that big fat 14 is built in respect in the market for the dog. And my concern is this for Georgia, because Georgia wants to run over everybody. They want to play Jeff Schwartz football and just beat you to death in the offensive line, run you over, you know, run for 180 yards, set up the pass via the run. Can Georgia railroad Clemson for four quarters? I I have my hesitations there. I haven't bet it yet. If I could get 14 for sure, I will fire the dog. But at this number, even at 13 and a half, I lean to Clemson. Yeah, I'm with Sammy, and I think he hit on the the key matchup here, and that is uh, the running game. And look, Clemson, look, they, they've set a standard for themselves. When you win national champions championships, uh, when you're not at that level anymore, that's why people are, are sort of down on them. But uh, I think, Barry, you bring up a good point where, okay, maybe they're not the national champion team of uh, the past with Lawrence and with Watson, but they still have pros on defense. And I think you, know, I, you never want to base a handicap on a game from three years ago. I think that was 2021, the ugly 10-3 game where nobody could really move the ball. And I think it was Labor Day weekend, too, or early in the season. Yep. But I, I kind of sense a similar game where uh, I just don't know that Georgia can score enough to uh, you know to cover this number. And you know every time it, it has hit 14, I think, a couple times. But it's that – and you see that with some of these matchups. It, it's a ping-pong match. Miami, Florida has been the same way where every time it gets a three or three and a half, it gets bet down. Every time it gets bet down, it gets back up. So uh, I think Clemson plays good enough defense to hang in this game. I, I would bet Clemson, if anything. The problem with Clemson is their quarterback, yes. who is far worse on the road in neutral site than at home. He has three times the interceptions he throws on the road or, or neutral site than at home. And just look at the better defenses they played last season. They played 50% of passes against Notre Dame for 109 yards. Miami, 52% of passes. Florida State, 65. That's good for him. South Carolina, 55%. Like at Duke the, early in the season, week one, yep. they lost, right? 62%. Like, is Clay Klubnik better than in year two of this offense. If he's not, they're not going to cover this game. It, it might be low scoring. It might be 28-10, but I don't expect them to move the ball well if he's not playing much better. Do I feel comfortable enough to lay it with Georgia? I don't think so, Bear, in this spot. But we got to see more from that quarterback position to feel comfortable that Clemson can cover this game. Yeah, I think of everything in, in, in this game, I think under 48 and a half would be uh, what I would look at here because just as a lack of faith, in Clemson's quarterback and in Georgia's defense usually does pretty good uh, against these non-conference opponents that don't see Kirby Smart's defense year in and in year out. So we, we could very easily be looking at like a, a 27, 14 type game where Kirby's just uh, reliant on running the ball, using those tight ends, even, even without, uh, Bowers, they're loaded loaded at tight end still. They, they got a, a a bunch of guys there who contribute. So, yeah, under 48 and a half would be the play here for, for me in, in this game. So then the other – one of the other ranked – the other ranked matchup on Saturday, uh, Notre Dame at Texas A&M. This is a game is basically seen uh, one-way action on the, uh, on the Aggies here. Uh, I mean, I think it was a pick earlier at some point during the year. It was one for a while. Now AM out to three against the Notre Dame team, who I think we all kind of have some concerns uh, on what we're going to see from the Irish's offensive line. Uh, obviously, you've got the familiarity with Elko and Riley Leonard. Uh, Notre Dame, do they have the playmakers to really uh, 
separate against what should be another really good A&M defense? And does A&M have the playmakers on the offensive side of the ball? Because remember, last year, if it wasn't for Evan, Evan Stewart or Anaya Smith, they weren't moving the ball. And, and they lost a running back earlier in camp. So A&M may have struggles moving the ball as well. 46 and a half was the total I saw. I like under 46 and a half here. Will, any, any plays on this one? I'm with you, and yeah, you could have uh, you could have gotten A&M plus a couple of points during the summer, and this total has come down to 48 and a half, 49. So uh, my favorite play is Notre Dame team total under 21 and a half. It's only minus 115 to a couple books uh, for the reasons you mentioned. Notre Dame inexperienced on the offensive line. It's all freshmen. It's all sophomores. It's only a handful of combined starts between the guys they're going to throw out there, and you're talking about an SEC team on the road, uh, a really good front four for A&M. You got a bunch of NFL guys on that A&M team defensive line. I, look, I, I don't know what's true and what's not with the NIL. I did hear somebody told me A&M has spent almost like $10 million in NIL on their, on their oh, defensive I'm sure. line, it, which it, is just include, insane. If you include Nolan, who's now gone to, to Ole Miss, totally, and I'm sure they, they dropped a pretty penny on Nick Certain from, uh, to get bring in from Purdue as well. Yeah, I mean, that's almost what Jeff got when he went to Oregon. I don't <laughs> yes. know if it was uh, NIL or, yeah, or more, what that, actually, that yeah. suitcase was. but uh, under, no, look, the, under the table. To drop it yes, off the absolutely. Little uh, little blue chips with uh, with happy <laughs> dropping dropping off the tractor and the duffel bag of cash. Uh, I just think Notre Dame's gonna have a hard time scoring. Elko knows Riley Leonard, and that's always a matchup that favors the coach because the the coach knows what the quarterback likes. He doesn't like, especially a defensive mind like Elko. I don't think the the quarterback Leonard is sitting there, you know thinking about uh, what does my coach like or dislike. It, it's the other way around. I think of some of those uh, matchups when uh, when the Bills had Drew Bledsoe and he just came from the Patriots and they'd have to go to New England and play the Patriots. Belichick would just you know pick, pick him apart, undress him. So I, I see a similar sort of matchup here. 21 and a half is a key number. I don't think they get the three-plus touchdowns and, uh, and beat me. Notre Dame team total under 21 and a half here, Sammy. How about 21-20 Irish? Oh, no, Perfect. you need under. 21-20 A&M. That's better, right? Yeah, that's better you, because yes. I don't have under 10 and a half wins, wins for the year. Yeah, I'll take that one. That's, that's better for Will than no. Yeah. I thought he said 21 and you say 21 and a half or 20 and a half? 21 and a half team total under for Notre Dame. Oh, so either way, whatever. Either way. Keep it close. I think Notre Dame's D line is going to dictate how this game plays. And let's also understand in years past, when Notre Dame has gone on the road in the SEC, they're catching a lot more than three, guys. They're catching seven. They're catching 10. This is respect, I believe, for the Irish. And I think. If Jeff did not lie to me, Jeff jumped in with me last week on Notre Dame plus three when the two and a halves were starting to turn. It was like the leaves in the fall. They go from green, they get into that reddish color, and then they just fall off. I believe plus three is a solid bet. I'd be curious enough the threes are going to last. We might see this come back the other way, and uh, I think Notre Dame plus three is one of my favorite bets of the weekend. It's getting a little popular to take A&M, but you could have done it at a pick em. You mm -hmm. could have taken some points maybe before that. You could have laid one. You could have laid two. Now you're going to lay three. Worst time to bet right now at minus three. Uh, Sammy, I'll be quite honest. I'm I'm a little worried about this wager, buddy, because um, <laughs> the fires remorse. The, fires I, remorse I, I, from Schwartz. I did take Notre Dame under 21 and a half points as well, um, as I did more research on their offensive line. It's a, it's a problem, guys. Like, we're going to see this theme, I think, throughout the first couple of weeks. Um, there's a lot of young offensive linemen going on the road in situations I think are really tough for them. And the thing about Notre Dame's offense is, you know, when you're on the road like this, you need to generate explosive plays. You cannot have 10, 12, 13, 14 play drives with an inexperienced offensive line. They're going to get your quarterback killed. So I don't think Notre Dame can generate the explosive plays to get themselves in a situation to score enough points to maybe keep up with AM. The only reason why, Sammy, I like Notre Dame in this spot is everyone's an AM. I, I every year we do this with with AM. And look, it's a talented team. I think they're seventh in overall team talent, uh, the the composite uh that 24-7 puts together. But they have a new coach. They're unproven in a lot of places, a lot of hype again. And you know, I think Notre Dame matches up well, as you mentioned, with their defense against AM's offense. So I still have the plus three, but I'll stuck the Notre Dame under 21 and a half. I do worry about their offensive line. It, it's a tough task. A bunch of freshmen on the road, loud environment. It's going to be hot, right? It's a 730 kick uh, Eastern, but 630 Central going to be hot there as well for the Irish. Uh, it feels like a tough uphill battle for them. It's interesting because everyone talks about Kyle Field and this great home field advantage. If you go back since 2000, Texas A&M in games where they are ranked and they are hosting a top 10 team, they're 3-10. and 10. 
So it's not like they pull many upsets. And that goes back over five different coaches, RC for Coach Fran, Mike Sherman, Summy, and and Jimbo. So it's interesting that they just always, even these kind of hype ranked big matchups come into play. They never can quite get over the hump recently. I mean, that the Alabama win uh, on that last second sidewinding field goal, A&M was a, kind of an afterthought in that game. They were a massive underdog, uh, weren't ranked. So, I do expect a a lower scoring game in this one, and, and hopefully be a, it'll be good viewing after uh, I hit the road from Morgantown, where Big Noon will be on on Saturday morning. Uh, Penn State now down to eight, I see as a favorite over the uh, the, the Mountaineers. This is a, a game where I like Penn State in this game. Uh, I laid the eight. I was ready to lay eight and a half, and then, and then I, I I waited. I'm like, yeah, let me just see. It's come down or, uh, some already and see if it can maybe come down some more, and I don't have to buy it down to eight. And sure enough, it did come down to eight. If you And, and this is courtesy of uh, Ralph Michaels, who uh, I did a pod with a few weeks back. If you And this is not the reason why I'm playing Penn State, but it is a pretty damning number. Not damning. It's an unbelievable number. Since 2000. If you look at James Franklin, Penn State, in games that they are favored by seven point, by between seven points and twenty four points, so basically you're eliminating the games that have long been 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 decided blow uh, blowout type uh, rejected games. So like games with kind of kind of something in there, sixteen zero and one against the number. It's just it's almost impossible. I had to go back and look between seven and twenty four points. If you just look at as a, t- a touchdown favorite or more. 26 and one. So that's still pretty damn good itself. But I worry about West Virginia here. I know they're they're talking a, a big game about how uh, Penn State ran it up on them last year, scored late. But if you look at the three games West Virginia played last year against teams that wound up finishing the year ranked 0 and 3, lost by an average of 25 points a game. So they beat the teams that they should have beaten, maybe pulled a little, a little upset. Uh, along the way to get to a surprise nine-win season. I'm not necessarily sold that Drew Aller is the guy to necessarily handle Andy Colton Nicky's offense, but I think between that offensive line and the running backs, Allen and Singleton, a defense which should still be great, uh, even though they lost some guys off the best defense in the country last year. Tom Allen now in, is familiar with the conference, familiar with that area of the country. I think Penn State is still going to be very, very good I would be very disappointed and surprised, uh, Sammy, if they did not win this game by double digits. Let me poll the room real quick. Since 2005, in terms of ATS, where do we think James Franklin ranks? Let's go around the horn real quick. Out of all the coaches, where does he rank ATS since 2005? Give me a guess. Overall, think, ATS? Not, not, yep. not, I'll say I think, he covers a, I think he covers a bunch of games. He always seems to score late to get that cover. Uh, 57%. I'm, I'm going to say it's, it, it's, are we talking like a, like a ranking in the standings? Like where he I was, was going to say, give me the place. So Jeff guessed a percentage. Will <laughs> will almost nailed it. He is third since oh, 2005. Go. I yeah, win the you prize. Remember, you got to remember too, he was back at Vandy catching points and all those games. And, and before like people really caught on to like what he was able to do at Vandy turning that program around. So yeah, that does not surprise me at all. But he covers as a favorite at Penn State. I think the most unfair treatment for James Franklin is to compare him to Urban Meyer or Jim Harbaugh or whatever because he's just not that guy. But in terms of covering as a favorite, and you gave the Ralph Michael stat as a favorite, this guy makes you money. The only two coaches that are better ATS since 2005 are Mike Gundy and Jim Tressel. That's it. He is better than every other coach to put him on the sidelines. This guy is just one of those dudes that finds a way to cover the number. And the other part about Franklin, I say this in a respectful way. Uh He's kind of a prick. He knows (laughs) what the number is. He knows that the boosters want to cover the number. And how many times, whether it be the West Virginia game, the game last year against Northwestern, when he had the backup take a fake knee and throw a touchdown pass to cover like 27 and a half, he knows what the number is, and late in games, he tries to cover that thing, guys. So I'm not laying, or I'm not taking eight. You know, I saw this dip down to seven and a half for a brief second, got blasted back up. You know, you could have taken 10 with West Va. Now you're going to take eight against a coach who's ticked <laughs> off, who wants to cover, 
and is probably going to cover, mm -mm, it's Penn State or pass for me. Yeah, I think you guys pretty much covered. I don't have too much to add other than I, I might look at a Penn State team total over 30 and a half because I do think they'll get their points. Um, you know, I I probably would have leaned towards West Virginia. Bears dissertation there, I think, talked me off of it a little bit. And like Sammy said, you're going to take – Eight when you could have taken ten. That's not a good habit to get into. I think Penn State with Colton Nicky uh, gets their points here. I think it's a good matchup for the Penn State offense. So Penn State a team total over thirty and a half. I think is a good play. Just remember, all off season, all James Franklin has, has heard is the offense couldn't produce explosive plays. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They can't do it. What's he going to try to do in Week One? Produce a lot of points to shut everyone up. Right, like I, I think that, that Will's onto something here with the offensive explosion we could see with, with with Penn State. And to Sammy's point, is that it's not going to stop, right? Like he's not going to be up thirty-one, you know, fourteen or thirty-one seventeen, and say to himself, "Oh, we're done." No, he keeps going and going, and going. He's done that year over year. So I think they look to make a statement offensively in this game. Now, West Virginia offensively has a lot back, though. They might be able to keep up at some points, but I think Penn State's defense, while losing a lot, has recruited very well over the years. I think Penn State covers this game, and they score a bunch of points. Yeah, I think they're really expecting Trey Walls to have a big impact, and we'll see if Julian Fleming, the Ohio State transfer, can give them a little bit more uh, in the past game. I'm not I'm not sure Ohio State was too disappointed or uh, dismayed that, that that Fleming left, being that you know, the Buckeyes have so many wide receivers, but at Penn State, we'll see if he can, uh, if he, if he can fill a role and, and help that Lions offense. So, I've already got my Saturday planned. Show from ten to noon, big noon. We got. I'll be in Morgantown, kick, taking that one in. Uh, Penn State, West Virginia. We're going to finish up. We're going to do some some segments, I'm sure. And then I'm going to be in a car with hopefully brewed by a fellow Miami guy, Bruce Feldman. And I'm going to have the iPad up. I'm going to be watching the Canes and the Gators. Canes uh, about two and a half point favorite now. Total is around fifty four. As a Miami alum, I am scared to death of, of this game. All we have seen and heard in the offseason is about the, the, the portal and Cam Ward, and, and you, 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 you bring in Damian Martinez, you bring in Sam Brown, you bring in Barrow from Michigan State, Barron from Tennessee. Like No, no team outside of Ohio State has really uh, gone as portal heavy as Miami has. And, and you, on the other side, Miami, oh, they're going to win the ACC. They're a sleeper national championship contender if everything goes right. And on the other side, in Gainesville, you got old Billy Napier who has already been fired by all of his head coach, by all of his fan bases and everyone around the SEC. What are they going to do with quarterback Graham Mertz, whatever? Guys leaving the program. Uh, your win total is four and a half. You're going to uh, – losing season. This couldn't be a worse setup for Miami as a small road favorite going on the road to an SEC rival, uh, in-state rival who's expected to have a bad a bad season. Like, it, you couldn't ask for at least for a better emotional setup and an intangible setup. Jeff, like, how, how much – how like, put yourself – take me back to, like, 19-year-old Jeff Schwartz, 20-year-old Jeff Schwartz, and and he heard all offseason about how his team was going to suck – and you've got uh, this top potentially ACC champion coming in, in-state rival. How would how would that have been received in the locker room amongst the staff? Like like does this does this, does this stuff really play, or am I making too much out of it? It, it plays early in the game, and then Miami's offensive defensive lines that are better take over, right? And like it, it's fun for the first quarter. You're at home, right? It's gonna be a, a crazy atmosphere. It's gonna be hot. It's gonna be sweaty. Um, you've heard all year that you might not play well, your coach might be fired, all those things. You're exactly right, Bear. But then by the third quarter, when all those guys that, that Mario has recruited to beat up to beat up people in the trenches start taking over, it doesn't matter how motivated you are. And and that's the difference in this game, right? For 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 this is Mario's third year in Miami. He did what you should do, right, Bear, which is you recruit high school players in the trenches, you supplement with some transfer portal players. And in year three, all those guys develop and now you're ready to, to, you know, to kick ass this season, which I think Miami is going to do. I like the addition of Cam Ward, the addition of, of, of Martinez, and I think they win this game. Look, I've said this for years now. I'm not worried about a Mario Cristobal coach team in a big game. He came through. I watched it happen to Oregon. They went to Ohio State as a 14-point underdog and beat Ohio State in the trenches. That's how they won that game. When they go play Cal Bear in Week 7, I'll, pick, I'll take Cal plus the points, okay? I'm not taking it here. So I think Miami wins this game. I think they cover this game. Uh, they're the better team, and they show up 
under Mario in these big games. He's not making that statement. He hired a clock management coach. Finally, like he, he like he realized there's a problem. So I I appreciate that from him, uh, Sammy. I think that uh, Miami covers this game and wins. You, I'm all in on the U. It, it is what it is. It's already done. I've talked about this for a month. I'm taking the U. I've taken the U. Got him to make the playoff. I'm not scared. I think Mario channels all this out, and they come out and whoop up on Florida. Florida's win total is four and a half, guys. Florida's not that good. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that, that's uh, about the toughest schedule you're ever going to see, not just in the country, but any year ever. I mean, that Florida schedule is brutal. Uh, I, I would lean towards taking the SEC team at home, getting the points. Now, you missed the three, you missed the three and a half, so I don't really want to sit here and pound the table for plus two and a half. But uh, I'll tell you this, I'm excited to watch the game because whoever loses, that coach is immediately like under the microscope. I talked about this last week, where if it's Napier, like Bear said, he's already been fired, fired a million times. Cristobal, with all their spending in NIL, they come off a seven and six season, they get... Uh, Smoked in the bowl game against Rutgers of all teams, uh, and there's going to be some pressure if he starts 0-1. Uh, there's going to be you know some finger pointing and saying, "Hey, what's going on? Do we really have the right right guy?" So uh, I'm most excited for this game. If I could only watch one game this weekend, it would be this one. And Bear, you were describing your day, your Saturday. You did leave out some key things that people want to know. People want to know the meal situation because you're going to be you're not going to be sitting there starving, eating celery all day. What are you eating? What what's the food situation in Morgantown? Uh, well, I haven't been to Morgantown in, in a while. We're actually we're trying to. Think figure out a place to go uh, for, for dinner on Friday. I think Oliverio's might have been a place that we went to uh, in the past. I, I can't, John Murray from uh, the Superbook passed on some uh, places that he got from from some friends of his. Because I asked Murray, who's a West Virginia grad, and he's like, I haven't been to Morgantown in 10 years. Let me ask the fellas. So he passed along some places as well. But I, I'm more I, – I can't – see. going to need gonna need like a boxed lunch for the road. And then when I get to the Pittsburgh airport um, – Probably going to be slim pickets, but next week is is going to be like an all time type food situation in Ann Arbor because you got Zingerman's, you got great great steak plate, great Italian all over Ann Arbor. But but like you, you could do the double of Zingerman's for lunch on Friday, lunch on Saturday, and, and you can't go wrong with with the with with a Reuben or or a sandwich or a, a matzo ball soup. Like it, it all it oh. all it all plays for uh. So, for for so Fran good. Arbor and Zingerman, so we'll we'll, we'll we'll get back to you on what we have for uh for from for Morgantown or not, and let you know uh where we head. But weekend doesn't end on Saturday night. Weekend ends Monday actually this week with the uh, Florida State BC game, where it might be a time to maybe buy low on Florida State with that number being down to fifteen and a half, maybe under as well. We'll we'll, we'll see what happens there. But Sunday night Vegas uh, LSU USC. Uh, USC, a four and a half point dog now, a total of 64 and a half. I played under 64 and a half. I know there are some people out there on the other side that like the over 64 and a half. Uh, but I, I just think with these two teams replacing two Heisman Trophy winners at quarterback, and granted, Miller Moss played well in the, in the bowl game last year against that terrible Louisville team. Uh, and certainly Nussmeyer has been around for LSU. But bringing in Dan Tenneland at SC, uh, bringing in Blaine Baker at, at, at LSU, they're tasked to make these defenses better. I think I think it's a pretty good spot in, in a situation where most people are going to be expecting a super high-scoring game uh, to go under 64-and-a-half. I really don't have a feeling on the side. Uh, I know Dr. Bob uh, released uh, – USC plus the points, and that obviously that game moved to moved a bit after he he did it. Uh, Sam, do you have any thoughts on the uh, the side of the total on this one? The high total, guys, and I think this new communication rule is going to slow these games down at least in the early going because offenses aren't in that much more of a rush because you have more communication with the the coordinator or the coach and the quarterback. And if we go back to that Florida State and Georgia Tech game in Ireland last weekend. Only 14 possessions. That's nothing. I saw this said that that was the least amount of possessions in an FBS game since November of 2020. So if you're only getting the ball six, seven times a game, you really have to be extra efficient against a USC defense that's better than it's been. And I think this LSU defense is underrated this year. They brought in a lot of talent, not only in, in players that they've recruited, but guys in the transfer portal. That's a lot of points. And guys keep betting it up. They keep betting it through the 63, through the 64. Um, I have no reason to even pounce right now. Like, I could probably wait this out, 
get through Saturday. They're going to bet the over again on Sunday. You think guys are going to come in and whack the under on Sunday? I, I don't know. What if we get like a 65 or a 65 and a half, at which point if you get a couple punts, you're probably the favorite to cover, barring a 28-28 overtime, which will go over the total. But that's that's a lot of points for two teams that should be better defensively. The thing about the the, the defense, I'll just talk to USC, is yes, they brought new coordinators, but they also need better players. <laughs> like it's great to have coordinators, but they don't have a lot of pros on defense. Like their their three best pro, pro potential players, two are transferred from Oregon State, and one's an undersized defensive lineman. Like I, I get that. I understand that they're going to be better on defense just because they'll be in the right place and they'll probably tackle better. I love how they, much Jeff hates USC. But I they don't. They, they just don't have the 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 pro guys on offense. Think about offense. The depth chart right now is four sophomore wide receivers. They're that are they're coming out there for like their first like time being full time starters, right? Miller Moss first time starting, but I do think that people are betting the over because they looked at Lincoln Riley having more prep time, and we've seen early in the season at USC they score a lot of points early in the, early in the year, and I think people are looking at that and saying, you know, hit the over here. But the best unit in this game is LSU's offensive line. That's why I bet LSU. I think it, overall, at the end of this game, that's the unit that 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 takes over in the fourth quarter, and they win this game and cover it for LSU. I like USC. Uh, I'm looking to fade LSU. I just think you lose the second pick in the draft at quarterback, a couple top 20 receivers. All right, maybe you're a little better on defense. It would be hard. It, it'd be hard to be worse than you were on defense last year. I just don't know, like what you lose on offense. I don't know that a, a, a tiny uptick on defense makes up for it. And you know, I, I thought USC was really. Uh, lacking talent last year. I do think they'll be better this year. Receiver, offensive line, backs. I just thought it was really, it was Caleb Williams, hey, go make a play. And that was uh, about the extent of their talent. I think they're a little more balanced this year. USC is a team I like. I just think, sort of like with Florida, where they're just going to get swallowed up. That is a brutal, brutal schedule. But uh, plus four, plus four and a half, I think are good bets on USC. I, I did bet them. And look, if you want to sit this one out and just live bet, Somebody's with even with a total 63, 64, even if we think it's going to be a little lower scoring than that, you're probably going to see some enormous swings where you can get either team, you know, at plus prices and just you know, go for a middle because uh, with these higher scoring games, you're usually going to get a better number at some point on whatever team you like. So uh, I like USC it should be a, a fun game to watch here, though. Sammy, I'll start with you. Give, give us a give us an underdog. You might you might be doing a little, uh, little sprinkling on the money line this weekend. Well, maybe I already sprinkled there on Florida Atlantic, bringing back a whole bunch of starters. Oh, Michigan State. Get Michigan State out of my face. This number is 14. I took 14, and I took a little money line. Let's see. What price did I get on the money line? I want to say I got like 483. It's some obscure shot. Just just to throw out a number, 483, for example, just might have been 483. Just. 483 seems to be seems to be a good number for me. Uh, you can get plus 460, plus 450 right now. Obviously, you stagger the bets. You bet more on the plus 14 and less on the money line. But I would not be surprised if the Owls came out and upset Michigan State. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, Tom Herman at Houston a long time ago had a very good reputation of pulling upsets over uh, Power 4, Power 5 teams uh, back then. Um Quarterback, the quarterback com- wide receiver combo from Marshall. Um, yeah, we, we'll we'll see. Aiden Childs all talking about. Oh, I'd bet the over in this game. We'll we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how good Michigan State's going to be. I, I I like both of those plays uh, quite a bit. Will are you are you going to uh, are you are you going to get us aggregated on the uh, the, the Colorado t- uh, hashtag uh, Bears bets pod hates Colorado. You, you, you're going to get us going off week one on a good Well, play. they got the two best players in college football, Will. Be careful. If North Dakota State somehow beat Colorado on Thursday, standalone game, first night of college football back, do you think that would get any attention on Friday? Do you think <laughs> do you think anybody would spend time talking about it? I mean, that would be just uh, a news cycle for 24 hours that I would love to see. I think North Dakota State's live. I know, Barry, you talked about, hey, it's not their best team. These teams, these FCS powerhouses can usually hold up in the trenches. It's, uh, it's usually the speed, the athleticism, and maybe Colorado's just too fast for them. 
But uh, I'm just not a believer in this Colorado team. I I know they've talked they want to be more balanced, run the ball more. Uh, I just I don't like them defensively. I don't like their offensive line. I know they think they're improved in all these areas, but they weren't buttoned up last year. Remember that Stanford game? They had a million penalties. You know, they're taking the ball first in overtime. Just a lot of mistakes, uh, really, from that team. And look, we see it every year, week zero, week one. We saw it last week. If you like a team, if you like an underdog plus the points, it, it, you should be sprinkling on the money line because it's very hard to price college football to begin with. There's so much variance. And with the transfer portal, NIL, all this stuff, uh, you see these big underdogs win outright all the time. What was it last year? Texas State beat Baylor. Colorado beat TCU. We saw last week big uh, big upsets uh, happen or almost happen. You know, SMU was a 28-point favorite, should have lost the game. New Mexico, you go down the line. So if you like an underdog plus the points, I mean, we're going to be sitting here on, on you know Saturday, Sunday, texting back and forth. Man, this team... 17-point dog, day one, 20-point dog. There, there's going to be a couple. There's a couple every year. All I heard was that Will doesn't like Colorado. <laughs> so make sure we aggregate that in, in the right manner, guys. Um, I, I'm going to take Stanford at home against TCU for a couple reasons. One is that it is hard to play at Stanford. Like, it, There's going to be 7,000 fans in that stadium. It's going to be the first game. You're going to be so excited. You're going to run out of the tunnel, and no one's going to be there. And we've seen over the years, early in the year, Stanford plays much better at home because teams are just not used to playing there. Go, go, you know, go back to, to their schedule, one-point loss, seven-point loss, six-point loss. It, it's just a hard place to play. They do return a lot of production, does Stanford. They had a really young team last season. I don't think they're good. I don't think Stanford's going to be good this season. But in this specific spot with a bunch of returning starters, a bunch of returning production, first home game of the year, it's just a good a coach, hard too. He's a good coach. To yeah, Trey Taylor's good. It's just a hard place to play. They, I'm, I'm just, it, it, I've been there before in the old stadium. Uh, a lot of teams struggle. Or Oregon last year, I think, was up six nothing at halftime. It, it Stanford. It's just a, it's a sleepy, dreary place. You have to bring your own juice. So I'll take Stanford plus the nine. Stanford, of course, uh, pulled that big upset over Colorado last year. That was the, the game that Will was uh, referring to. With all the uh, taking the ball first and all the. That, that 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 I think was the the eye opener for a lot of people that all might not be as well as, as you might expect it to be uh, in Boulder. But any other uh, any other plays of note yeah. that um that you guys have that you want to get out there that we may have missed? Oh, Holy Cross. Is that no? Sam it's not Steve? Holy Cross. I got a I got an extra game for you though. Oh, Uh-oh. I know. Okay, we let's love get the, the number. Let's get the let's get the rotation number out. Make sure we get that. Three zero oh, eight nine four nine. Bingo. We are going over in Kansas and Lindenwood. Uh, this totals fifty eight and a half. Kansas going to score maybe sixty three by themselves. And Kansas, look, is very good offensively, very good schematically, defensively. Hmm, might give up a couple scores here. So I'm thinking this is going to be like. 55 to 10, 55 to 13. We're going to go over 58 and a half. I expect that wink, wink, uh, to be in the 60s by tomorrow night. All right, and then that'll yeah, uh, that, that that is I was gonna say that is Thursday night for uh oh for those who are on that little 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 I, little. So uh, you can you got the double screens going. You got you got the Bison against Colorado. You got you got old Lindenwood for find that on like maybe uh. Kansas uh, local cable access or something like that is probably where you're going to even the Jayhawk Sports Network maybe. Might, yeah, they uh, could have spread these games out a little more. I think we have three at eight o'clock Eastern starting one. You could have uh, you could have spread these out. Oh boy, I look at my card. I got some ugly ones, Bear. I know you like some of these ugly dogs sometimes. How about Georgia State getting 21, 20 and a half, 21 and a half against Georgia Tech? Uh, it's it's conventional wisdom to think these teams that have played a game that have a game under their belt do better against the teams that haven't played, but that's not the case. I guess it's just uh, if you look through the data, the teams that haven't played have the advantage uh, for whatever reason. You get film on the opponent that the other team doesn't have film on you. Maybe Jeff can speak to that. And I just think Georgia Tech coming off a big win, the travel, uh, you know, getting reacclimated to the time zone. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a sleepy spot here for uh, for the Yellow Jackets. So I like Georgia State and. Is Michigan really going to cover 21, 21 and a half against Fresno State? They have Texas on deck. Uh, that's a team that lost a lot of offense. They're going to be running the ball a lot. And if they have a big lead second half, they're up 14, 17. Do they really have the need to run up the score, show anything on film? So Fresno State, Georgia State, uh, not pretty, but that's uh, that's how we start off college football. And Bear, I was texting you about this before. This will be my last thing. DraftKings has these markets. 
highest scoring half, first half versus second half. And a lot of these games where the line is 35 plus, the first half is only minus 180, minus 190. But think about how these games usually go. The favorite gets a huge lead, and then they just kind of milk the clock the second half. So uh, I don't know that those are priced properly. I, I'm curious what you guys think. It, it, depends on, it, de- it depends to me on the second string, right? Like, for example, I like Oregon-Idaho over 63 because Oregon's backups, their backup offense is going to play to score every single drive. Like, they might score 35 to 42 in the first half. Dante Moore comes in, and the backup offense tries to score every possession. They're, they're, they're not going to slow down. They scored 70 against Eastern Washington. Two years ago, they scored 81 against Portland State. Now, those teams are, are worse than Idaho. But I think Oregon's going to score a ton of points. Same thing with Utah. They play Southern Utah. It's 52 and a half, 53. They get everyone back on offense. Like they're going to try to score a ton of points in their first game back with Rising and Keithy and Sing- and Dorian Singer's there now. Like to me, some of these contests where you look at teams that are going to continue to try to score. The other one I like, I texted Bear about this earlier. Like Iowa minus 22 and a half against Illinois State. That's a little disrespectful. Like Illinois State's not. They were six and five last year. They were not a good, a good, a a, a good FCS team. Iowa. They'll be better on offense. They're not going to be Oregon, but they're going to be better on offense. It, this feels very much like a thirty-one nothing win for Iowa. Yeah, I, I think the, the, there's so much narrative about Iowa and their offense that they're going to be better this year, uh, and the early reports of how the, the scrimmages how they haven't been. Yeah, we, we'll we'll see how they do. We'll see how uh, Iowa State does. Obviously, they got North Dakota this week, and certainly uh, Iowa IS, Iowa State. Um, Next week, obviously, always a, a massive rivalry game. So, good talking to you. I'm, I'm glad we got the uh, the, the Lindenwood play in. I, I was a little con- little concerned. It might be too early in the week for. Uh, and, I got and, it, Sammy. But, but, but I made it. I made the wager. We had to, we had to do it today. We don't have any shelf life. We got to get it going. And I'm telling you, by Thursday night, that line is not going to be 58 and a half. Well, I, I hopefully it is posted right now in certain places for us to. Uh, to play it, see, I think that's the beauty of us. We we get to play this stuff before it gets popped by everybody else, and and, and hopefully people out there all get some uh, we get some good numbers. But it's awesome, great talking to you guys again. Uh, I'm looking forward to having another uh, entertaining, enjoyable, and profitable season. We hope, and uh, we'll do it again soon. All right, Bear. So many wagers in the gambling group chat. Hope everyone was able to to keep up. I I did make the Kansas wager, Bear. Uh, I made the FAU wager. Will and I are sort of on the same page with some of these wagers already, so uh, we, we're we're full steam ahead. What did, did you pick out a wager in gambling group chat that, that that you might you might hit now? Oh yeah, I I immediately hopped on my my DK app and uh, where I was the only place I found that Kansas Linden. I know. <laughs> and DraftKings that was kind enough to give the uh, <laughs> like the week one college football uh, uh, sweat free bet where if it loses you get your uh, your a bonus bet back. So. Uh, we're, we're we're watching Candace Lindenwood Thursday night with the uh, with with the, uh, the second screen of the game. We like it so yeah. And I had played, I had played FAU as well. So I was happy to see Sammy was That's on that. Play, yeah. And then um, the oh, but before we get to to our best bets, the one I want to add, Bear, is I was looking at this a second ago. We talked about uh, Michigan, uh, Fresno State. Whether Michigan is looking ahead to Texas. How about Boise State on the road at Georgia Southern? Georgia is getting 13 points. Yep. Boise State goes to Eugene next weekend. This is a spot where I think Boise State's a little sleepy, looking ahead. We're going to try to save as much as we can for Oregon. So Georgia Southern here might be good. A plus 13 spot. Yep. That's the uh, the the fighting Clay Helton's. Clay Helton can coach. Just didn't work out at USC. Correct. And they they had some success there. I actually wrote a little. A little script, a little, uh, little, little element for the Big Noon Show on Saturday, where I kind of have like three, three games with some contenders, whether it's for a college football playoff berth or potential uh, conference title. You've got Virginia Tech on the road as a double-digit favorite at, at Vandy. You've got uh, Boise as a double-digit favorite on the road at Georgia Southern. You got Oklahoma State as a double-digit favorite hosting the reigning FCS champion. Like three games that don't be surprised yeah. on Saturday if you look up, and maybe those games are a little bit closer uh, than you might think. So yeah, you just kind of try you can try to incorporate a little little element like that with just some kind of games like that uh, off the map. Maybe not necessarily a pick, but just some things you might want to watch yeah. on uh, on Big Noon on Saturday as well. Yeah, what one other play I do have. That we did not cover yet, and I kind of hinted at it in the uh, 
the gambling group chat, I, I did lay 15 and a half with Florida State. You could probably look under uh, is well in that game. I, I think what number? I laid I laid fifteen and a wow, half. That's Florida. really it was it was it was, it was I got 20, BC was twenty on got, Saturday. Yep. I got BC plus twenty and a half on Saturday as I figured the line would would uh would would move so furiously after that game. Now um, you got a five point so, middle if you want yeah. it. And, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect BC to do much offensively. No. But but I think that the most alarming thing if you're a Florida State fan is how that game wasn't a fluke. Um no. like they committed one penalty didn't turn the ball over and they just got whooped up front at the line of scrimmage. So uh, we'll, we'll see if they can bounce back. I, I, I laid 15 and a half that they will. Um, something new this year that we're going to try uh, Jeffrey uh, yes. with, with you, Jeff's fade of the week. Let's do it. Uh, basically kind of it's just, just looking for a, a nice little uh, fade one way or another yeah. way fading the big favorite, whether you're going to be favorite fading a, an underdog who, who are we, uh, who are we fading this week, brother? I'm fading UCLA going on the road to Hawaii. I like Hawaii plus 14. This number was 13 and a half, maybe even 13, but bounce back up after Hawaii's uh, performance at Delaware State. Guys, Bear, throw that game out. That game, I, I told you earlier, I tried to watch that film. It's ridiculous. Hawaii did not try. We knew. They talked about beforehand saving everything for UCLA. But more than just a fade about the Bruins, right? A lot of turmoil in Westwood. I like the Sean Foster hire Bear, but it was late in the cycle. He doesn't have his players there. They also lost so much on defense. They lost their four t- uh, top sack producers. They accounted for 30 of their sacks last year. They lost four or five secondary players. And they lost their D.C. They lost a lot on defense. They do return players on offense. I get that. But I don't know how they translate Bear to Eric Bieniemy's offense. Eric Bieniemy has been in the NFL for so many years now, translating to college. I was at Big Ten Media Day. I think it's taking a little bit of time to get the terminology down. It's a very wordy offense. And um, I just believe UCLA is going to struggle this season. They're going to struggle at Hawaii. I get two touchdowns here. Hawaii's passing attack. They, they return their quarterback. The run and shoot year two now. They played better than the last season. They won three or four games in the last season. I think Hawaii's a much better football team. So I'm going to take Hawaii here plus the 14 points. Yeah, I, I like the uh, I like the idea there. I mean, we, we talked about that how like even before last week how Hawaii probably will be looking ahead to the UCLA game. So I, I agree with that. And uh, we, we'll see. We both are pretty heavy on UCLA unders this year. Yes. So, uh, it, it, how much do you buy into the idea that teams in Week One and Week Zero, I should say, struggle in Week One against the spread? I think this. I think the Hawaii game against Delaware State is like excluded from all this. You know, all these trends because, again, yeah, Delaware yeah. State is is it, it's like a scrimmage for Hawaii. Like it, worst it, game it, in the MEAC. It, 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 I throw it out with I throw that trend out with those games. Um, so all right, Bear, what is your best bet? The first one of the college football season, where are you going? Yeah, I laid 10 with Rice against Sam Houston State. Woo! Uh, yeah. Yeah, Let's I, I go. think I, I think Rice is a uh, is a dark horse to win the AAC this year. Uh, I, I think bringing in Warner at quarterback will make that offense better. Mike Brooklyn has a lot of guys back on that offensive side of the ball, and he's it's the rare example of an administration really giving a head coach time to kind of build his program up. And I think they'll be rewarded this year. I think Rice is going to be very good this year. We saw Sam Houston make that trans- uh, transition from FCS to FBS last year. It didn't necessarily go great. Um, I think it's going to, going to take another year or two before they do that. Rice laying 10 against uh, Sam Houston, my uh, best bet for week one. Oh, uh, we are back. We are so back, everyone, with a Rice best bet in week one. Bear, are you going to watch this game? Are you going to put, put Rice on your, your second screen? Are you going to just hope it, you know, get scorebook updates? I'm probably not. I'll be I'll be probably uh, reduced to just finding this game on, on an app or a website on my phone while a, either uh, on my way to the airport or at the airport or uh, hopefully the flight will have a uh, Wi-Fi on the flight home late on Saturday. And so uh, I, I love it. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think we're so certainly just kind of uh, hoping for the online gods to um, to deliver for us. If not, we'll be refreshing the score page consistently throughout the day. I like it. I like it. Bear. All right, Bear. My best bet. I'm going to Nebraska, minus 27 and a half, big number against UTEP. This is a, a play on just Nebraska's returning 
players in production and an addition of a quarterback in Rayola. I know it's a true freshman, but last year the offensive struggles bear were because they turned the ball over too much. They return offensive linemen, they return running backs, they return good wide receivers. You add the quarterback into the mix, and this offense is going to be supercharged. Defensively, they were great last year. Seventh against the run, 27th uh, against the pass. They return eight of those 11 starters to this defense, including a great defensive line. I think this Bryce team is really good. More than anything else, Bear, UTEP is not good, okay? <laughs> UTEP is basically an offense pieced together with Austin P transfers and five new offensive linemen. Hear that again. Five new offensive linemen are going into Nebraska in, in week one where Lincoln is ready for this team to explode Bear, right? They're ready for some winning in year two under Matt Rule. Defensively, they only return three of, uh, of 11 starters, does UTEP, and I think Nebraska in this situation at home, they're going to want to score a ton of points because of Royola being there. Also, Matt Rule in year two at Temple and Baylor, big wins against bad opponents in week one. I think Nebraska handles this game bare. I can see Nebraska scoring in the upper 40s and UTEP scoring 10 to, to 14 points. Well, excellent analysis. Good luck with that. Um, You're not buying the... Uh, the 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 Nebraska yeah no 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 I I am I, I I'm just sitting here as I was thinking I'm like I'm like bad loses more than like good wins it's kind of it's kind of like that dumb loses more than like smart like it'd be, you, you can never really go wrong uh, going against a a poor team like that if you think they're going to be indeed uh, that bad man I, I've 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 laid Ooh. points with Nebraska so much so many times I, I, I know. know new new day it's a new day with Rayola buddy I, I just I, talking to Matt Rule at Big Ten Media Day, and maybe there's just like too much you, you get kind of hyped up and like, but him talking about just Rayola understanding protections and how to do things with line scrimmage, mm-hmm. and again Nebraska's recruited well. They have a lot of good football players. They, they have good wide receivers, good they're, they're returning offensive linemen, good running backs. Like they just their offense last year just couldn't hold on to the football. Like they're, they're fumbling quarterback. Well, it's, been their, it's been their program for the last ten years. They well, I know. I, I'm betting on I'm betting on Matt Rule here. It's a good bet. He's he's won conference titles at Temple and Baylor, so it's a it's a it's a, it's a good bet to make. Speaking of good bets to make, we we got some uh, some some plugs for this year. We, we're adding a uh, another show to the Bear Bets Podcast Empire. So we'll uh, we'll have the College Pod, which is going to be Wednesday, the NFL Pod, which is going to be Thursday, and then on Friday, myself and Bruce Feldman from the site of Big Noon Kickoff are going to hop on uh, and do like a Twitter space uh, about probably around 1.30, 1 1.45, 2 o'clock uh, Eastern time every week where we'll be on Twitter taking your 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 questions and spaces and uh, uh, kicking around for a little while. And that will obviously be uh, posted up to the uh, the Bear Bets pod feed. So looking forward to uh, Bruce coming up uh, coming up with some, uh, some intel and some storylines for the coming day. And then uh, Love it. My, my reaction to it and some picks as well. So uh, that'll be fun on Friday. And then obviously Saturday, Big Noon Kickoff is uh, is on the air. Oh, so. we're back. We're so back, Bear. We are back and bigger and better than before. So I love it. That, that That's all for, uh, for week one. Uh, again, appreciate Sammy and Will again all year long for the, for the College Gambling Group Chat. Uh, appreciate everybody out there for uh, downloading – rating reviewing subscribing uh, check out the uh the youtube bear bets channel there uh, make sure you follow us on spotify apple wherever you get your podcasts most importantly however remember that the less you bet the more you lose when you win <laughs>